thanks to Kaspersky for allowing me to help open uh, this conference. One of the things I love about it uh, is it's really a great showcase for the ingenuity of defenders and how that's overcoming the stealthy resolve of attackers. And it's a really great time to be in network defense. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I was at a meeting with Bill Gates. And while Bill is mostly focused on the work of his foundation, global health, education, uh, he still works with Satya, the CEO, on matters that are important to Microsoft. And he wanted to meet on security, and, and when Bill, Bill asks you to meet on security, you show up. Uh, and naturally, Bill's interest, he wanted to go over what is the architecture, what are we doing? And so, of course, we talked about security architecture, things like hypervisors and hardware security. But I was impressed that what got equal billing with all of those things was the everyday stuff that man matters to defenders defending networks. You know, what are we doing against pass the hash? Tell me about this credential guard thing. Those kind of things are reaching the top levels, you know, taking bills of time and attention. He's very curious to see what we've done in that area. For me, it was a very interesting moment because over 10 years ago, I was at a meeting with Bill where we asked him to write what became the trustworthy computing memo. And back then, the crisis was software security. And at that time, it was the defenders were way behind. Uh, the state of practice in industry was very poor. The breakthroughs that we needed hadn't been made yet. Attackers had a lot of advantages. And in an eerie way, network security now feels a lot like software security did then. Um, and so it was kind of with that mindset, I, one thing I get to do in my job is talk to a lot of really great companies and organizations and talk to the defenders at them. Uh, and I'm just, one of the things that I hear that sort of pierces the gloom of all the headlines of breaches and whatnot is, despite all that doom and gloom that you hear, there are a set of defenders that are being very successful at defending their networks. But why is this? And what I wanted to come and talk to you about today was what I've seen in my journey talking to these defenders and what they're doing that's different. And one of the key things that I find them doing differently is, yes, they learn the core principles of information security, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and how to protect things with that, but they're interpreting it in a very different way than traditional network defenders have been taught. They're taking the stuff that didn't work and they're discarding it. The stuff that could be improved, they're altering it. The stuff that doesn't even exist that they needed to help, they invent it. And so with that, what I want to help walk you through in this presentation is some of the key things that defenders are doing differently. In traditional defense, they've kind of grown up with this traditional InfoSec wisdom and received it. And all of it makes sense on its surface. Uh, but underneath, it's not as effective as it needs to be. They tell you to defend a list of assets. Fix, fix, identify the things most important in your network and defend them. Domain controllers, whatever it might be. Be good at incident response. If you have an incident, keep it secret. That is confidential. If it were to leak out that you had an incident, that would be a terrible thing. God forbid a competitor find out what it is. If you have people that work those incidents, don't send them to conferences because you don't want them to blab, or God forbid they might get recruited by a competitor, and so on and so forth. Pen testing, they think about it as like a report card. You build your network, you do pen tests, and you find out how, how is it doing, and it's more viewed as an output. And they think about stopping attacks. And these, more, these newer defenders that I see, what I call modern defenders, they don't think they have a list of things to protect, they have a graph of things to protect. And they don't think about incidents, they think about adversaries. And instead of keeping incidents secret, they find trusted peers in the community because what they want to do is they want to maximize learning by talking to others and finding out their practices. And they think about pen test not as a report card, but as a diagnostic. And it's an input to their processes, not an output from it. And finally, they think about not just stopping attacks, because stopping breeds a mindset that's ignorant of attacker counter moves. All they think they're doing is increasing attacker requirements, whether that's two-factor or whatnot. They know adversaries will respond, and they're constantly thinking about what that response might be. So I want to go through three ways that I've seen that these attackers, these new, these, these defenders against these new attacks are different. Um, and I'll walk through them. The first one is they assume breach and they think in graphs and not lists. And so a lot, what I find in network defense goes wrong right here, which is how the defenders view the battlefield. Uh, and if you ask defenders what's important, they will start telling you about things, lists of things in their network, domain controllers, certificate authorities that issue certificates, file servers that are critical where their data resides, so and on and on. And actually, defenders are awash in lists from asset inventories, business continuity, disaster recovery, uh, things like certifications. Certifications demand that InfoSec people create lists of things that are important. Uh, 
But what defenders have is a graph. And I say, as long as defenders think in lists and attackers think in graph, attackers will win. And, the, and a way to illustrate that is, if you take any account in any network and say, this account is important, and if it becomes compromised, it's game over for us, of course you need to protect that account. If its credential is stolen, uh, it's game over. But that account logs onto a server. If that server is compromised, that credential is compromised. But that server has other admins of it. You compromise any of those other admins, you compromise the server. Those admins in the normal course of business log on to yet other servers. And what you start off with, a list of things that are important, you end up with this graph. And most of hacking is finding some way to land in your graph, spear phishing or otherwise, and then dumping credentials and discovering and enumerating this defender graph that exists to go find and get to what their objectives are. This is an example from a real network. Uh, we work with this customer. This account, very important account, it's a God account in their network. Uh, and it, what it was designed to do is scan machines in the network for vulnerabilities. They had a large network. So their vulnerability scanner run in these 50 VMs. Obviously, you compromise any of those 50 VMs, you get the credentials of this God account. Uh, but then you ask, well, who are the admins of those systems? And now you get a graph that looks like this, where all of a sudden these other clusters of machines that had nothing to do with the core security of that God account now have a pathway to it. And it's like, do you think the laptop down here of some admin on the corner realizes the security of that machine has a tie to the security of the entire network? So everybody knows the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. This is one step. This was two steps. And this is part of the reason, we see this in networks all the time at customer networks, where the connectivity that's there between these accounts, the siloing is not there. And this is why things like credential dumping and pass the hash, lateral movement are such a nuclear bomb for networks these days. So how, are the, how is the graph created? Uh, the edges come from how you make your network, how you log on, the control relationships that are within it. Um, I think of exploit writers. Those are edge makers. That edge didn't exist before. You found that zero day, you wrote an exploit, now you can create an edge uh, that didn't exist before. If you reuse credentials across two untrusted networks, you've just created uh, a link, an edge between those networks, and so on and so forth. And actually, um, many of these certifications that the current generation of InfoSec professionals grew up learning and practicing talk about uh, these are the attacks, confidentiality, integrity, et cetera, that you need to defend against. And to do that, use these kind of controls that are vulnerability scanning, access management to mitigate those things. Um, but the issue with this is those controls, they're not like magical stuff. Like in Minecraft, there's a special block called bedrock, and it's the one block you cannot break. It's different than all the rest of the blocks. But this stuff is not made of bedrock. It's made of just the same stuff as that information that you're protecting. And those controls have their own information that is susceptible to these same kinds of attacks. And so you start off with a list of controls to protect your stuff, and you end up with this lattice of things. And it's really information all the way down. And that's why these certifications, they teach people use these controls to defend your network, but they don't teach you how to make a defensible network with them. The second thing that uh, these modern defenders do well is they manage adversaries and not incidents. And so um, a typical defender uh, will learn from the breaches or intrusions that happen. They will find infrastructure that the attacker has used to spearfish them, maybe where those emails came from, the domains where they got lured to, if they got late stage malware, the command and control stuff that it's beaconing out to, they will learn about that infrastructure. They'll find the malware that's used, the first stage, second stage, et cetera, and start learning about the capabilities uh, of that adversary. Um, and then the more incidents they have, of course, they will learn from those. Uh, and one of the things that modern defenders realize is there was a time in my life where I got really interested in chess. And I learned and I practiced and I finally went to a tournament uh, and I played uh, a 10 year old and he beat me. Um, and the thing that's really frustrating about getting beaten by a 10 year old is when it's their time, the clock's ticking, they're thinking, they're pondering their move. But when it's your time, they're like staring off into space, they're like thinking about Minecraft, they're not thinking at all. And eventually you realize as a defender, you mature and you realize, I don't just have to think on my time. Attackers are busy all the time with a whole bunch of intrusions all over, and I can learn from those intrusions even though they're not in my network, and I can use that to go hunt and understand what's going on. And so 
this leads you, these defenders, to a place where they realize the attacker has a graph as well. All of, they reuse those techniques, that malware, that infrastructure across lots of intrusions. And if you study those, you will start to find this attacker graph. And then they start to practice these techniques to discover and capture the attacker graph, to manipulate it, and to shape their graph. I'll talk about discovering the attacker graph in a little bit more detail in a little bit. But they use analytics, they use threat intel, and they use hunting techniques, like they write YAR rules, and they run them over virus total, and they search repositories with them. And that's helping to reveal these edges and nodes in this attacker graph. And they share this graph with other defenders to try to put the picture together. And if you do a remediation in an incident, what you're doing is you're trying to destroy the attacker graph. You're deleting nodes from it. And you have to do that in just the right way because if they have three backdoors in a network and you delete two of them, you've really done nothing. And so you have to really understand this. Or they rewrite nodes in this attacker graph. They can man in the middle their C2 communication. Or they can use sinkholes and start to manipulate it. Uh, or they can shape their graph. Uh, you can start to create this terrain in your network by using the right kind of multi-factor auth, just-in-time admin, whitelisting, so forth. And the modern defenders, they understand what is scarcest to the attacker, and they want to deny them that resource. And they work it like that. There's a stash of zero days. They're going to find those and get those patched, because now we've deleted that from every graph that they've had. So I want to talk about how they capture the attacker graph. Most network security teams collect they have sensors across their network, and they collect the alarms from those sensors, and they have a SOC or a security operations center where they manage and respond to those alarms. But to do network security right, it's really a data-intensive problem. To find those needles to protect some critical data, you really need data from all over your network to do it. You need the, whole, the haystack, and a lot of network defenders, a part of that job is managing a very unruly haystack. And just at a network at Microsoft, you can see these numbers get big quickly. Half a million hosts on just one of our networks. We collect a ton of data, sensor data, across that network, 20 terabytes a day. And because if you went to a network defender team and you said, I'm going to make compute and storage free for you, you would defend your network in a fundamentally different way. And we use our cloud to do that. And I think what defenders will realize is they can't protect on-prem networks without the power that the cloud gives them on compute and, and uh, storage because of the ability to store all of that contextual data that they'll need to get the answers here. And so I have a model that I call the Defender Pyramid, which is really about taking all those key data sources in your network and not treating them as silos, but linking those together. You, can, you find attackers when they move. And so you need to capture all the, all the traffic that's going in and out of your network, your in ingress and egress traffic, and link that to your host, because the host, that's where the action happens. And you need to capture every access and all of the authentication events that happen, every Kerberos ticket, every NTLM authentication, because that helps you find their lateral movement. And then if you have threat sensors, capturing those indicators as well. Because you might get a hit on a backdoor that's on a host, beaconing out to a C2, that leads you to another host talking to that same C2, that the attackers actually came in on, and then you find out some set of accesses they had in your network, which leads you to why they're here. And it's crucially important to understand not just their footprint on a network, but their objectives in a network. Because if you can't uncover the attacker's objectives in a network, you really can't fundamentally protect the network any better. Uh, and so we have a variety of analytics that we've written at Microsoft that traverse all sorts of attacker TTPs, anomaly detection, uh, and we score and look at false positives, false negatives, precision, recall, and make sure we have coverage all across uh, the intrusion lifecycle across these things. And if you collect, if you go from a model where you collect alarms to where you collect your data, you're going to enable a very different kind of intrusion detection, a type of intrusion detection I call time travel breach detection, which is over the lifespan of an intrusion, uh, that attackers are doing different techniques at each phase, and most defender teams are focused on what's happening now. They're collecting things through their scene, they're looking at the stuff that's happening now, and that is really how they're working stuff in their network. The problem is, when attackers are late in your network, it's actually fairly hard to find them. They have your legit credentials, they know your network very well, they know the workstations of the admins of the important stuff, and they can use that to, to lurk and hide and sync. But you have a chance, actually, if you collect the data, not just the alarms, to find them anywhere along their attack lifecycle and use all of that to discover them. And so you may be better at finding them at initial persistence when they drop that back door 
or at their noisy enumeration when they're knocking around discovering domain admins or whatnot. And when you find that hint, even if it happened three months ago, you find that because you as a team, as a defender team, are getting better all the time. Your skill sets are growing, your threat intel is growing, your capabilities are growing. And if you can look backwards in time and find it, if you have your data instead of just your alarms, you can walk backwards to find out how they got in and you can walk forwards to find out where they are now. And it's a different kind of breach detection that you can do. I think uniquely empowered by the cloud. The other thing that modern defenders do well is they share. They show up at conferences like the SAS conference and others, and they share information. And we're in a world where defenders are sharing vital information about adversaries across geographies, across industries, even within lines of competition. Eugene talked about it earlier, competitors meeting and talking to each other about these threats because the threat is the common thing that they face. But these folks, they do this well because it's not like there's some magical uh, information sharing thing where you put your data in there and it just routes it where you need. It is very trust-based regime. People know each other, they meet each other. It's why, kind of why the networking is so important at conferences like this, to get to know the people because that's, you're not trading information with Microsoft, you're trading it with this person that works at Microsoft or this person that works at Kaspersky. And they understand traffic light protocol, what they can share, what they can't. They give credit, they respect equities, so on and so forth. And they share without any immediate expectation of payback. It's not a transactional relationship. They know that, hey, look, this threat analyst is really good covering this malware set, this intrusion set. I'm going to give them the indicators that I have on that because I want them to go find more. And I know that one day that will matter to me and I want to go empower them about it. When I think about the different kinds of benefits that come from sharing, I think about them in a pyramid like this, which is... At the top, it's sort of the most immediate payback that you get from sharing. And at the bottom, it's the most indirect, uh, but I think the most important. At the top, if you, if you exchange threat intel with somebody else, you will get some immediate addition to your knowledge, and that's great. Um, ephemeral, but it's great. The next thing is if you take that malware and you signature it, and then you start finding it on machines around the world, you've given the adversary some temporary reset. They have to go... Uh, maybe get busy on that intrusion and then start uh, putting their new toolkit down, recompile, so on and so forth. And you've given them a reset, though ephemeral it might be. And then doing this work with others and sharing information so that you can do these resets, maybe those resets really don't give a macro impact to the adversary, but a benefit to defenders is that you improve doing coordinated action. And that's a value in and of itself. Because maybe that reset that you did against that adversary wasn't that big, but just the muscle building of working across the different security industries, doing these coordinated things, uh, that, that takes people getting to know each other as well. And, and one day, you'll need that uh, coordinated action to do something very important. The next thing I think is really important about sharing is if you care about a certain set and you start to learn about it, by publishing about it, and this is one thing that I think Kaspersky does very well. They publish about sets, and all of a sudden, they awaken all these analysts all across the industry, and their knowledge of these intrusion sets starts growing and growing because they published, because they didn't keep it secret. And it promotes adversary coverage, and that ends up helping everybody in the end. And then the last thing that I think is the hardest and most indirect in a way, but I think as a set of defenders, as vendors, that is almost our most, most important thing, which is to help the victims awaken in their cyber maturity model. Pretty much at every company, uh, they are on one side of the detection chasm or another. And on one side, what I mean is, uh, I find a lot of customers, they're stuck on the wrong side of the chasm, which is they're not detecting anything interesting. They don't have the skill sets, they don't have the tech, they don't have the people, the talent, the analysts, and they don't find anything interesting. And management doesn't invest anything more because they don't really have anything worth reporting or finding in their network. And that's sort of why I say so, poor, like, poor cybersecurity teams stay poor because they can't cross this detection chasm. But once they find that one pay dirt activity in their network, you know, every, every company is kind of like the cyber come to Jesus where it gets real and it's the time that it awakens it and now it's time to go get the talent and the skill sets and the management support and whatnot. And a lot of that happens because of the research and the products that the people in this room help make and contribute to. And awakening those victims so they, they further on in their cyber maturity, I think, is a, one of the most important things we can do. Because in the world of cyber, nothing gets better unless victims start defending themselves better. It's, it, government's not going to come to the rescue. It's not a silver bullet product. The, 
the victims have to fundamentally understand how to get better at cyber themselves, hire the right talent and skill sets and people to do it. And furthering them on that journey is a big thing that, that defenders can do. The last section in here is what I call full stack defenders. And what I mean by that is these modern defenders, they're not just using the, tech, the tools of antivirus and seams and, and logs. They're tooling up and down the stack. So I'll give you an example here. Um, there was a customer that we helped out that had an intrusion. And when the customer uh, knew the adversary was coming in and they wanted to understand that activity, they had forensics people and they could spend time in forensics examination to find out what they did. Uh, forensics takes hours or days um, to do. And so they wanted to turn on the best logging in Windows that we had at the time to give them viz. And that logging was a feature called App Locker. And when they turn on App Locker logging, this is what they learned the attacker did. The attacker term served in, so Explorer fires up, attacker gets a command prompt, he does a ping command, he does a net command, he does a find command. Uh, and the customer was saying, this is kind of helpful, but it's really like, I want to know what he net and find and ping. That's what would help me uh, figure out what's going on. Uh, so we have some superpowers at Microsoft. Uh, I went over to uh, Mark Rosinovich's house and I said, look, we really need to help this customer out. We need to get him some better tools. Can you create a stripped down version of maybe your process monitor tool that just logs the full command line? Um, Mark was actually preparing for his talk at RSA at the time and he said, uh, I'm busy. I'd love to help. And I said, look, I'm really good with PowerPoint. You're good with device drivers. How about we make a deal? And, uh, and Mark popped out uh, this tool called Sysmon that we've published. And it's now on like version three. And it has, you can think of it just like Emmet is good for exploit mitigations. Sysmon is great for the event log. It just lights up all kinds of stuff that's helpful. And this was the visibility that they got with the command line. And it's just so much more immediate understanding of what the attacker is interested in, what accounts they know about, what the grip is on this customer network. So we went back to the Windows guys and said, your app blocker stuff could use some improvement. Look at the difference in situational awareness this makes. They added that into Windows 8 at the time. Now it's been backported. Windows 7 and above have the ability to collect command line through group policy in your environment. Um, and then further in, window, in later versions of Windows, Windows 10 and so forth, there are a ton of eventing improvements that help you collect this data from your network that have been added into Windows because as defenders, we don't just have to work with what's there. We can change what's there. Uh, and then PowerShell, a lot of attacker interest in PowerShell. IT pros love it. Uh, malware authors are using it. APTs are using it. And uh, Lee Holmes, the PowerShell dev, dev, added a ton of PowerShell logging improvements that are in there for, right for defenders to take advantage of. Another f example of full stack defending is uh, everybody here has heard of exploits in the browsers. And it used to be 10 years ago, it was hijack a, a return address, stack buffer overrun. How does that work? Okay, now my grandma can do it, get it. Um, and this is the recipe today for what exploiting a vulnerability in a browser looks like. It's a much more complex recipe. It's construction of ROP chains, getting information leaks so you can explore the address space, find addresses of the things you know about. But at Microsoft and other companies, we have a set of our technical fellows, distinguished engineers, and principal devs that are working on breaking every piece of this recipe with changes to the kernel, to hardware, to user mode, kernel mode, stacks, the browsers, et cetera. And not just at Microsoft. Other defenders, the other browsers that you use, they have people working with us using the techniques that we develop, inventing their own, adding those to other browsers and other plugins to the browsers, and doing so at an op tempo that would have been unimaginable uh, just a few years ago. We used to put maybe one of these out every time we shipped a major release, every 18 months or two years. These are coming out now in every Patch Tuesday release. Every single month, new ones of these are dropping out there. And is it making a difference? Uh, here's an example of a security researcher has a secret stash of zero day. And after we put, uh, pushed out one of these changes for IE that changed how the memory protection was done, all of these zero days that he had went away, didn't work anymore. Not because we found and patched the vulnerability, because we're breaking the recipe that he's using. I have to say, when I see these kind of tweets, you know, a single tear rolls down my eyes. Uh, so sad. And we do see the number of uh, exploits in the wild for vulnerabilities in the browser has gone down. Uh, dramatically as a result. Uh, and the newer browsers that have these mitigations built in by default, um, it's making a big difference. Um, and the last example that I'll give here is 
Um, what you see in this, uh, this chart here is uh, that section of the chart represents the attacker's command and control nodes uh, outside of the victim network where this was done. Um, and those command and control nodes service a whole variety of intrusions that that intrusion set was very busy with. Um, now, we at Microsoft got a copy of not the, just the client-side Trojan malware here, but also the server-side controller software. And we took it and then we wanted to go give the adversary a, dis a disruption to go protect this customer. Um, we put it in our antivirus, Forefront. Uh, I love me some Forefront, but what we see, Forefront's only as good as its aperture, and there's other antivirus programs that have visibility in places that Forefront doesn't, Kaspersky and so forth. And so we started working with them, giving them the signatures so that we could do it. But Microsoft has another superpower that we have, which is we have the ability to run uh, an anti-malware cleaner tool on every machine on the planet. And every Patch Tuesday, there's a tool called the MSRT, the Malicious Software Removal Tool. And when we put a, it doesn't have the full complement of the antivirus signature set. It has just a few specific families. And up until that point in time, what was in there was uh, the broadest, the broad spectrum malware, like uh, ransomware, crimeware, these kind of things, banking trojans. And we put this threat actors, the first time we put an APT groups controller software in this, and then we ran it on 1.2 billion machines one particular April. Uh, and overnight, that adversary lost 1,000 command and control servers that they had amassed over the years, painstakingly. Uh, and so this is just an example of how we can push adversaries back in the life cycle and get them busy again. Um, and we've since improved that process to not just do one-off Microsoft actions, but we have a process called the Coordinated uh, Malware Eradication Program, CMEs, where as antivirus vendors, security vendors, we come together and target specific families of malware, APT or otherwise, and try to go give the adversary a coordinated reset about it. And it's just one example of all the different ways that these modern defenders are using the full stack available to them, changing every layer and working across vendors to go improve things. And so I guess I'd like to close by this, which is... Um, uh, we're moving from a world of information silos and defenders not sharing to a world where all attacker activity is going to be imprisoned in some b defender's big data system that they have that that attacker can't take away anymore. And all of their mis any, any OPSEC mistake that they've ever made is trapped, waiting for discovery by defenders that are sharing ever more across geographies, across lines of competition, to go find and ferret out that activity that they can't take back anymore. And once it's discovered, those, the proceeds of that are then shared by the security community to go give those adversaries a big coordinated setback to then, in those victim networks where those, where those intrusions are found, to awaken a whole new crop of defenders and give those adversaries better and better defenders to have to go fight against on more and more fronts than ever before. So with that, I want to thank uh, Kaspersky for the chance for me to open this conference, and I look forward to talking to many of you over the next couple of days. Thank you very much.